Welcome to the Last Safe Toolkit for a Home-Based Child Care Webinar Series, hosted by Child Care Aware of America, the National Association of Family Child Care, the Children's Environmental Health Network, Eco Healthy Child Care, and the National Center for Healthy Housing. I'm Tony Hunt from Child Care Aware of America, and we're excited to be partnering with all of these organizations to share information with you today about lead and consumer products and how you can take action to reduce the potential for lead exposure in your home base with your home-based child care facility. And thank you for joining us today. We recognize that free time is hard to come by and that these are especially challenging times to pay attention to anything other than to our families, children, and staff safe during COVID-19 or helping your business survive this global crisis. Regardless of whether you're joining us live this evening watching the recording during nap time, or finding another opportunity to learn more about dangers of, of lead, we appreciate your co commitment to protecting children from lead exposure. I just want to let you know that everyone is on mute, and this webinar will be recorded. Um, you can also enter your questions, um, and let us know if you have questions directly to the speaker during this webinar. During today's webinar, the last in a four-part series, we'll hear a little about the Lead Safe Toolkit from Home-Based Child Care. Learn about the dangers of lead, review a sample policy that you can put in place to help reduce exposure to lead from consumer products in your home-based child care facility, and share some tips on how to implement the policy effectively. If you listen to any of the first three webinars in this series, the next few slides will be a repeat of the information you heard. But hang in there for a few minutes while we reinforce the important context, and then we'll jump right into today's focus on lead and consumer products. Today, we'll learn about steps you can take to reduce exposure to lead and consumer products. But there are other ways that you and the children and staff in your facility can be exposed to lead. The other webinars in this series will help you address how to reduce exposure in lead and paint, in drinking water and soil. All of the webinars will be recorded and available online. And we encourage you to watch all four in this series. The first two webinars about lead and paint, drinking water and soil are already posted there for you to view. For those of you watching live, our colleagues at National Association for Family Child Care are pleased to be able to offer training certificates for attending today's webinar. Proof of attendance will be sent via email within the week of the live webinar. Please check your junk or spam email folder as it often automatically gets sorted there. If you haven't received your certificate within one week, please email NAFCC at the email address shown at the, at the end of today's webinar. To help us get started, let me introduce Hester Paul from the Children's Environmental Health Network, who will tell you a little about the toolkit. Thank you, Tony. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Hester Paul. I'm the National Director of our Eco Healthy Child Care Program, and I'm pleased to be with you. This webinar series is based on a toolkit that was designed to provide home based or family child care providers like yourselves with resources and strategies to ensure the safety of the children within your care. It's available online at the link on your screen. Like the webinar series, the toolkit is divided into four main categories. How to avoid lead exposure from paint, drinking water, soil, and consumer products, plus a general resources section. Each of the four categories contains a sample policy that you can adopt for your business and share with the families you serve. We know that there's so much to keep up with, especially during this time of the coronavirus, on a daily basis when running a home Based family child care. In an effort to support home-based providers, we have created four lead-focused policies, which detail best practice commitments that can be added to your parent handbook. Creating or adopting a policy ensures that a practice continues over time, regardless of whether or not you hire new additional staff. All staff should be on the same page about how to prevent lead exposures. 
Additionally, the families you serve may be interested in knowing how you yourself work to prevent lead exposures within your own home. You are welcome and encouraged to share these policies with the parents you serve so that they too can make similar changes within their own homes. Along with each policy is a worksheet to help you set the policy into action one step at a time. Each worksheet gives you valuable information about the importance of ensuring that homes are lead safe and gives approximate costs of the recommended steps to reduce lead exposure. These worksheets complement the policies, each four of the categories, avoiding lead exposure from paint, drinking water, soil, and consumer products have both a unique policy and a worksheet. And the worksheets are longer documents, more comprehensive. They offer detailed information as to how to go about making changes within your home, and they'll help you feel confident that you can uphold your policy. Links to the resources and contacts that you can consult as you implement the policy are also provided. As we've mentioned, today we'll be focusing on steps you can take to reduce exposure from lead in consumer products. We're gonna cover a lot of information and we've heard from childcare providers before that it can be a little scary and overwhelming. So if you only take away one thing from this webinar tonight, we hope that you know that help's available, that you can do this and we're here to support you. We know you care and that's the reason you're listening right now. And we created this toolkit to make it a little easier for you to take action. You definitely might not be able to do all of it right away, um, but that's also why we broke up the toolkit into different areas so that you can find the right starting point that feels good for you and your childcare home. And now to help us dive into this topic, let me welcome Dr. Manthan Shaw. Manthan Shaw is a health scientist at EPA's Office of Children's Health Protection, where he works on a number of children's health issues, including lead exposure. Prior to joining EPA, he worked for the New Jersey Department of Health, where he conducted environmental health assessments of child care centers throughout the state, evaluating potential hazards such as lead-based paint, mold, asbestos, and air quality issues. He has a master's of public health and also holds a PhD in environmental health and occupational health from Rutgers University. So I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Shaw. Thanks, Hester. And thank you all for taking the time to learn about lead and consumer products tonight. Um, lead can be found in all parts of our environment. So you know that lead can be found in the air, the soil, water, and even inside our home. Much of our exposure comes from human activities, including the use of fossil fuels, the past, the past use of lead in gasoline, some types of industrial facilities, past use of lead-based paint in homes, and past use of lead in service lines that actually bring the drinking water to our homes. Lead has been used in a wide range of products found in and around our homes. In addition to paint, this includes ceramics, pipes and plumbing materials, solders, gasoline, batteries, ammunition, cosmetics, children's toys, and more. So let's remind ourselves why it matters if children are exposed to lead and why your role as a child care provider is so important. Lead is particularly dangerous to children because their growing bodies absorb more lead than adults and their brains and other organ systems are more sensitive to the effects of lead. So it's important to remember that it doesn't take very much lead to create harm. So if you'll imagine a standard sugar packet that you might use to sweeten a cup of tea or coffee, now imagine that pack of sugar being filled with lead contaminated dust. This is equivalent to about one gram of dust. Now imagine that one gram of dust spread evenly over the area of a football field. So that's actually still enough for the EPA to consider it a contaminated surface. That means that the amount of lead contaminated dust it takes to harm a child is actually invisible to the naked eye. Sometimes when you say dust, people imagine this thick layer of dust in some sort of child care facility or some other um, empty space that hasn't been touched for years. But Surprisingly, you may not even be able to see the amount of lead contaminated dust it takes to harm a child. That's why it is important to know how to identify if you have a lead hazard in your home and, and what you can do to remove it. And we created this toolkit to help you do just that. So what happens when children are exposed? Very high doses of lead, which are 
rarely seen in the U.S. today can actually cause seizures, coma, or even death. However, even much lower levels of lead can cause issues including impaired executive function, which is the ability to plan, remember instructions, and juggle multiple tasks. Such blood lead levels can lead to reduced IQ and academic performance and can also cause behavioral problems such as impulsivity, hyperactivity, and attention issues. It's also important to note that even though lead is harmful in these different ways, children who are exposed to low levels of lead won't appear sick. The only way to tell if a child has been exposed to lead is to go to your pediatrician or your child's pediatrician and have a blood lead test done. It's also important to know that there is no safe blood lead level in children. Okay, so the next obvious question is, if lead is so dangerous, how do we get exposed to it and why are children at such great risk? In addition to being more sensitive to lead's harmful effects, babies and young children can also be more highly exposed exposed to lead because they often put their hands and other objects in their mouths that can have lead from dust or soil on them. Also, infants drinking formula are in danger if the formula is made with lead contaminated water. People may also be exposed to lead by inhaling lead dust from lead-based paint or lead contaminated soil from playing with toys that have lead paint or eating and drinking food or water containing lead or from fishes or glasses that contain lead. So a lot of exposure happens in and around home environments. We know from the National Human Activity Pattern Survey that Americans spend 70% of their time on average in home environments. That number is even higher for some populations, including the kids who spend time in your home-based childcare centers. Think about the number of hours those kids spend playing in and around your home and it becomes clear why it is so important to make sure that the environment is safe as possible. Since the focus of tonight's talk is on lead and consumer products, let's take a second to learn a bit more about how lead gets into our consumer products. Certain children's products made in other countries and imported to the U.S. are known to have a higher risk of containing lead, including toy jewelry and children's tea sets made of pottery. In 1978, the U.S. actually banned lead in house paint on products marketed to children and in fishes or cookware, but other countries still widely use lead paint, even on toys they import to the U.S. Antique toys and collectibles and older toys made prior to the ban can also contain lead. The use of lead in plastics has not been banned, so certain plastic toys made with vinyl or PVC, like bath books, bath toys, dolls, backpacks, pencil cases, and shower curtains may contain lead. Foods and liquids stored or served in lead glazed pottery or porcelain can become contaminated since lead can leach from these containers into the food or liquid stored in them. Lead may also be present in certain imported spices, spices and foods and folk remedies. Children can also ingest or inhale these lead contaminated particles. And the good news, however, is that lead exposure is preventable. We know how to find sources of lead in, in your home and how to fix them. You can start taking steps today to protect all of those in your care. And the best news is that steps to take today can start having an impact immediately. And again, that is why we created the toolkit to help childcare providers like you get started. So the toolkit has a sample policy you can adopt to help you protect those in your care from being exposed to lead and consumer products and to help you com communicate with parents and staff about lead and consumer products and the preventative steps you're taking to address it. There are two major components to the lead and consumer products policy included in the toolkit. They are, less, they are listed on your screen now, and they ask you to commit to regularly checking the Consumer Product Safety Commission website at cpsc.gov for current product recalls, and to avoid the use of products commonly found in home-based childcare centers, which, although not recalled formally, have a higher risk of containing lead. 
in addition to the general policy statement on lead in consumer products. The toolkit has a worksheet that contains some simple guidance on how to implement the two components of the lead in consumer products policy, which I'll talk about shortly. We suggest that you review and fill out the worksheet once a year and keep it in your family handbook so that you, your staff, and your clients can always have the most up-to-date information. So the first piece of guidance outlined in the worksheet is to screen your toys and children's toys for lead. To do this, we recommend searching your specific toys on cpsc.gov and generally staying up to date on current product recalls by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We do not recommend we do not recommend the use of test it yourself kits or lead wipes, which can be purchased online or from large home improvement stores when trying to detect lead in toys or products. Only a lab that's certified can accurately test toys and products for lead contamination. Kits and wipes do not show how much lead is present, and the reliability at detecting low levels of lead has not yet been established. The next piece of guidance in the worksheet is to ensure that you're not cooking or serving foods in old, imported, or handmade pottery. As we said earlier, lead can leach from these containers into the food. The guidance also includes children's play tea sets made from imported pottery. There are also a couple of ways you can help to reduce exposure to lead in consumer products. First, you can avoid having items that contain lead in your home. You can also take some steps to make sure that any items that do contain lead are less likely to contribute to lead exposure. With that in mind, the remainder of the guidance in the worksheet focuses on one, outlining specific items you will not have in your home-based childcare center, and two, actions you will commit to taking in this area to continue to reduce risk. The specific products listed to avoid due to a higher likelihood that they could contain lead include costume or toy jewelry and or charms, antique toys, toys or other items made of PVC or vinyl, or imported candies and folk remedies. The actions you should commit to taking in this area to continue to reduce risk include keeping keys out of children's reach, Washing toys weekly. If there's lead in the plastic toy, the breakdown of the plastic may cause lead contaminated dust on the toy. Um, you may also want to get rid of toys when they show significant signs of wear. We know that resources are tight and that and not keeping these toys can be tough, but toys that are worn may have a greater risk of lead exposure. As we discussed, we recommend staying up to date on recalls, toys, and products and checking the Consumer Product Safety Commission website prior to bringing new toys into your childcare. This will help you to know when you need to remove any CPSC recalled toys or other items of concern. If you check the website and find out that you do have recalled toys or other potentially lead contaminated consumer products, you should follow the recommendations provided in any recall about the product. Such notices generally recommend returning the lead contaminated product to the manufacturer. However, if returning the item is not feasible, then dispose of these items in your household trash. Most of the time, family residences are exempt from federal hazardous waste regulations, even if the product could be classified as a hazardous waste. However, it is important to note that state and local governments may have additional requirements for disposal of these items in trash. So it's always a good idea to consult your state and local government for more information. What is really important, however, is that you do not donate any of these items to a center like Goodwill, as another family may end up with these safe or with these unsafe and contaminated products. And finally, to keep arts and crafts time safe, use only fragrance-free non-toxic art supplies certified by the ACMI. We also want to emphasize that it is really important to remember to keep all records on file of the steps you are taking to reduce exposure to lead and consumer products on your property. This will help protect you and you'll be able to answer any questions that come up from parents and staff. So, so we know that we've covered a lot of ground tonight in a short amount of time. So thank you for being patient and, and just taking it all in. Um, and the good news is that all the information that we shared is also included in the toolkit that you can download for free. 
The toolkit also contains links to several resources mentioned throughout tonight's talk where you can get more information on how to safely identify and address lead soil hazards as you walk through the four simple steps we've outlined tonight. So to conclude, I just want, to rem I just want you to remember that lead poisoning is entirely preventable. We know how to find these hazards and how to fix them, and help is available. Thank you. And of course, if you have any questions, you are welcome to contact the folks at, Child at Children's Environmental Health Network. And they will do their best to get the answers you need to take the first step to reducing lead exposure in your home-based child care facility. If you are already, if you have already entered a question in the chat box during today's webinar, we will follow up with you. We do, we will have some time to cover a few questions. Um, but the ones that we don't have time, we'll follow up with you in the course of a couple of weeks. So it looks like we have a question, and I'll just go ahead and, and read it for whomever wants to answer. It seems like there are so many ways that children can get exposed to lead in family child care homes. What would be the best thing to do to get started? Hi, uh, this is Amanda Reddy from the National Center for Healthy Housing, and I think I can um, help to answer that. Um, it's a great question, and, and that's exactly right. As we've covered uh, throughout this webinar series, lead can be found throughout a child's environment. Uh, we heard earlier tonight a reminder that that can include the paint inside and on the exterior of our homes, our drinking water, the soil around our homes, and, and the wide range of consumer products we just heard about. Um, and even a few things that we, we didn't get to cover in this webinar series, uh, for instance, certain jobs and hobbies involve working with lead-based products and that can cause parents to bring lead into their homes. That, that can include things like uh, if you work with stained glass or uh, like to make your own fishing weights or you spend a lot of time at firing ranges, um, that's sometimes also called take-home lead exposure. So um, there, are, there are a lot of ways you can get exposed and it can seem a little difficult to know where the potential for lead exposure is for your specific childcare home without asking some questions or doing some testing. And that's why part of, uh, you know, part of why we created this toolkit and why each of the sessions, um, if you've been following along with the sessions, has tried to provide some guidance on how to figure out if that particular source, whether it's paint or soil, water, consumer products, um, might be a problem that you need to investigate or address in your own home. However, the most common source of exposure and by far the biggest contributor to lead exposure in children is still from lead-based paint and the lead-contaminated dust that is generated as that paint deteriorates and, and breaks down. Um, we know that this is pretty common. Uh, we, uh, approximately 24 million homes throughout the U.S. still have these lead-based paint hazards and these dust hazards. And as we heard earlier tonight, it only takes a very small amount of that dust to cause harm to a child. So, it's no coincidence that we chose lead-based paint to be the focus of the first webinars in this series uh, several months ago. Uh, we definitely hope that folks make the time to watch all of the all of the four parts of this series, but we encourage people, especially those living in homes built before 1978, to start by addressing lead and paint. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge that, you know, because we know that getting started can seem so overwhelming, and, and from the feedback that we've heard from folks listening to these webinars and accessing the toolkit, um, since we hosted that first webinar and hosted that webinar, we've added a page in the toolkit with links to more information um, in each state. So you can go there and click on your state uh, to find where you can find more information about how you might be able to get some financial help with either testing lead hazards or fixing any hazards um, that you find, just to give you some places to start to see if you can get some support uh, to start taking those steps that we heard about today. Thank you, Amanda. We have another question. It says, my state doesn't require that I test for lead in our paint and water or soil or consumer products, but I still want to look into the considerations to avoid children's exposures to lead. I'd like to be recognized for taking these steps. What do you advise I do to ensure my actions are appreciated? So this is Hester Paul from Children's Environmental Health Network. and. That's accurate. So every state has different child care licensing regulations. 
and um, none of them, I would say, comprehensively cover reducing lead exposures within family child care homes or center-based facilities. Some states are more progressive than others, such as Illinois, for example, that uh, requires the testing of lead and water before a facility can open. So I would say in this phase that we're currently in, where kind of the onus of responsibility is on the provider versus um, versus the state requiring specific actions through licensing, the best thing to do is to follow the standards provided within the toolkit. And again, to kind of keep up and review and keep your documentation on a yearly basis. And in the interim, what you could do is actually work towards meeting the objectives provided on Eco Healthy Child Care's 30 item checklist. So it's a self audit checklist where it covers how to affordably and realistically reduce potential exposures to all different types of heavy metals um, and toxicants within a family child care facility or center-based facility. So it's once you meet those objectives, you can become endorsed for two years, which is recognized by the Children's Environmental Health Network. And then that's a way to illustrate to the families that you're serving or to your colleagues that you are going above and beyond what's required by your state's child care licensing regulations. And it's a way to show your higher quality standards and care that hopefully will bring you more business. Thank you, Heston. It looks like we have time for one more question. Um, the final question I'll ask is, how do I know whether a child has been exposed to lead? I can take this one. Um, so as I said during the talk, the only way to know is by going to your child's pediatrician and having a blood less, blood lead level test done. Um, it's a fairly straightforward test. Um, the thing I also talked about during the presentation tonight is that you often cannot tell that a child has been exposed to lead, especially with the levels of lead that most children are exposed to um, nowadays. It's not like, you know, you'll see a kid with a seizure or um, anything of that effect. So you, if you're in doubt, definitely talk to your child's pediatrician and have him or her um, schedule a test. Uh, it's also good to know that certain tests, certain states also require children to get tested by a certain age. Um, so hopefully if you're in a state like that, then your pediatrician will automatically um, have your child tested for lead. Awesome, thank you for answering that question. Thank you guys for joining today's webinar. This concludes our four part series. Today's webinar and the, and the other webinars in the series are available to watch as recordings at the link on your screen. Thank you and have a good evening.